When I was growing up in the Baptist church, there was a very popular series of novels that people were reading by the name of Left Behind. These books depict the lives of those left behind at the rapture and describe how the Lord at the end of the world would descend from heaven and carry up with him those who were his own and would leave behind on earth those who did not believe to undergo a great tribulation. In the same way that the poet Dante in the Middle Ages, just as a literary figure, had a huge impact on the way that people imagine the afterlife, so this Left Behind series has had a huge impact on the way that people imagine the end of the world. Perhaps you've heard Christians talking about the rapture, the great tribulation, the mark of the beast, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the millennial reign of Christ, and other such things. The picture which people often paint of the end times is a scary one and can make us almost afraid of reading about it in the Bible. And to make matters worse, preachers in our Catholic tradition very rarely speak about the end times. And so the message that people end up hearing the most often is not the historic Christian viewpoint, but a very fanciful, somewhat extreme, and a relatively newfangled one. And the prevalent view of today was actually popularized by a single study Bible in the 1800s called the Schofield Reference Bible. Up until that time, the view most widely believed by evangelicals today was unheard of in the church. And I think it caught on because of people's fascination with reading the news headlines in light of the book of Revelation. But when Jesus tells his disciples about contemporary events, here's what he says to them. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. So what is the historic Christian view, and how is it different from that which is held by most Protestants today? That's what I want to explore with you this morning from our epistle. For St. Paul treats the last day not as anything to be afraid of for those who loved Christ, but as a happy reunion with those who have died. And our Lord Jesus in our gospel compares the day of the Lord not to a sci-fi novel, but to what? To a wedding banquet with joy and feasting for those who are ready for it. St. Paul therefore concludes today's passage with the command, therefore encourage one another with these words. And that's what I want to do with you this morning because the historic understanding of the end times is actually an encouraging one. So let's take a look. Paul begins by telling the Thessalonians, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. His purpose is not to strike fear, but hope in the resurrection. He writes so that his brothers and sisters would not be uninformed. See, the church at Thessalonica was primarily made up of Gentile converts from paganism. So these were baby Christians that he was writing to. They were anticipating the Lord's return, just as Christ promised. And yet some people in their congregation had recently died. And the Thessalonians were unsure about what this would mean for them. Were the faithful departed going to miss out on anything in the return of Christ? This is the misconception that St. Paul is writing to address. Now, there are other misconceptions which are prevalent today in our culture. The one that I hear the most often as a priest is that we'll become angels when we die. This isn't actually what the Bible teaches. The angels are separate creatures. God doesn't intend for us to be disembodied spirits for long. God intends for us to be ultimately resurrected human beings, just like our Lord, both bodies and souls. And so St. Paul tells us about what that resurrection is going to look like. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have died. In other words, St. Paul is saying that Jesus' own resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. That just as he was resurrected body and soul as a complete and perfected human being, so that is our fate too, and the fate of all who rest in Christ. Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. And not only will the departed not miss out on Christ's return, they will actually be granted the place of honor in the resurrection. For Paul says, This we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them. 
So St. Paul's saying that it's the dead who will rise first, who will have this place of prestige in the Lord's return. Far from missing out on anything, they're actually going to have the place of honor, being the very first to meet our Savior. Now, this idea of being caught up with the Lord in the air, this is where that concept of the rapture comes from. But there's a huge difference in how the early fathers understood this rapture compared with how many Christians understand it today. See, many assume, and I assume this until I grappled with this text this week, that being caught up with the Lord in the air means that we'll continue to ascend with him up into heaven. So it'd be like Christ comes down to do this kind of flyover to scoop us up and leave the world behind, as though Christians are getting out of Dodge. But the text doesn't say that. It turns out that this word to meet is actually the same word which that culture used to describe when a nobleman of a town would go out to meet the emperor or a military hero and welcome them into the city in a triumphal entry. In other words, they don't go out and leave. They go out to welcome him. And this makes way more sense of what our text is describing, because God wouldn't abandon the world. No, God loves the world, so much so that he gave his only begotten son so that none should perish. So the rapture doesn't refer to the church getting out of Dodge before a time of tribulation. The tribulation's now. We experience it every day. Instead, the rapture will be us rising up to meet the Lord with our loved ones who rest in Christ to welcome him with praise and honor into our world. I think it's going to be our love for him that gives us that ability to rise up to meet him, that we who lift up our hearts would by our hearts be lifted up to meet our Lord and welcome him home. Honestly, I think this is what you do to welcome somebody. I I remember growing up when my father would come home from work me and my siblings, we would run out to the driveway to meet him when he got out of his car and we'd walk in with him. Yeah, we were excited to see him again. We loved him. So our love prompted us to go out to meet him. Likewise, when you have family that comes in from out of town, do you see him pull up and then you just kind of wait for them to knock on the door? Like, no, you, you go out, you greet him at their car. No, in love and excitement, this is what happens. It's a, a rapture in, in the heart. It's this desire to welcome the Lord and um, to a, accompany him as he comes to our world. And here's what St. John Chrysostom says on the subject. If he is about to descend, on what account shall we be caught up? For the sake of honor. For when a king drives into a city, those who are in honor go out to meet him, but the condemned await the judge within. And upon the coming of an affectionate father, his children indeed, and those who are worthy to be his children, are taken out in a chariot, that they may see and kiss him. And as he descends, we go forth to meet him, and was more blessed than all, so shall we be with him. We get the same going out kind of movement in our gospel today. There were ten virgins, ten bridesmaids, five of whom were foolish and five of whom were wise. They await the coming of the bridegroom, and at midnight there's the shout, look, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So we see the same, we see the same thing that we saw in Thessalonians. Then adoring, excited rapture, those who love Christ go out to meet him. The bridesmaids go out to meet the bridegroom. And here, Christ's return, the judgment, the establishment of his kingdom, these things are all happening at the same time. So the rapture is not separated from the judgment, which is not separated from the reign of Christ. For as we say in the creed, he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. So the return, the judgment, the kingdom, these are things that we and all Christians agree on. All these things will take place. We just agree with the fathers that there's no reason to separate them out as separate events. Um, in scripture and in our creed, it seems that these three things all take place together. Our parable ends with the five bridesmaids who are foolish. They brought their lamps, but they didn't think that the bridegroom would take so long. And so they didn't bring any extra oil. The wise bridesmaids, on the other hand, prepared themselves for the long haul, so that whenever the bridegroom returned, they would find themselves ready. As we read, those who were foolish missed the boat. The door was shut, and therefore our Lord commands us, keep awake, for you do not know either the day or the hour. Yeah, there, there may be some of us here who are asleep, whose eyes are kind of closed to the significance of who Jesus is. And maybe you haven't had oil in your lamp for a long time. To keep awake means to look for Christ in faith, hope, and love, trusting in him for our salvation, making him the focal point of our hearts and minds. If we would be ready for him, 
And we would do well to welcome him even now in our hearts, welcoming him into our own lives so that we wouldn't be surprised when he returns again in glory. If you think about it, when a guest comes to town, it's only an unwelcome thing if you're not ready, if you haven't taken the time to prepare. Right? If your house is a mess, the visitor's bed isn't made, then it's going to be a stressful thing because your negligence has left you unprepared. But when you receive a guest that you love and are prepared for, whom you were eagerly expecting, you go out to meet them with joy. You've made your preparations. So it's only for those who are asleep, who have no oil, they'll be scrambling at his coming. And if, if you're not sure that you've adequately prepared, that you've received Christ into your life for the forgiveness of your sins, I'd invite you to come talk to me about it at some point this week, and we can make sure that we get some oil in your lamp. And explore what it means to accept Christ as your Lord and your Savior. For we know neither the day nor the hour. We ask for this preparedness in our collect this morning. Grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom. So we ask God for this virtue of hope, that we would be like those wise bridesmaids who are watching and waiting for the bridegroom, that our minds and hearts would always be recollected, always cognizant of the God whom we love, that we would ever keep awake. This is how we can welcome him into our lives, even now. So friends, this is the traditional understanding of the church about the day of the Lord. We agree with all Christians that Christ will come again, that he will judge the living and the dead, and that his kingdom will have no end. But we agree, especially with the fathers, that these events will all take place together. This is not something to be afraid of, so long as we keep our lamps burning and stay awake in love. For as many as prepare to receive him, they will never be left behind. For Christ is our bridegroom, and in resurrected bodies, together with those whom we love who are now departed, we will go out to meet him and welcome him into the wedding banquet. To him be all honor and glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.